My name is Stephen Long, and I host a show here on Rock Candy called Sacred Tension, the podcast about the spiritual discipline of asking questions. We cover topics from LGBT issues to faith and doubt and mental health. We talk to biblical scholars and have conversations about religious abuse and leaving faith and finding it again. We also talk to pastors and skeptics and cult experts who are all sorting out their own journey of faith. Please join me in these conversations on Sacred attention right here on Raw Candy. Welcome to the Eleventy Life Podcast. What's up, Eleventy family? Matt here. Welcome to this week's episode of Eleventy Life. I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, before we get started, a huge shout out to everybody that is on the Eleventy Life Facebook group. Um, in particular, uh, Jeff Varner, you posted this super cool video. It's like a stop motion animated film that is an unboxing video for some merch that you got from the Rock Candy Store. And I've never seen anybody go through so much work to do such a super cool and creative unboxing video. And I want to personally thank you for that because it made my day as soon as I got it. I immediately had to show my wife, Jessica, um, and everybody that was kind of in our friend group at the time. It was amazing. So thank you for that. Big news here in Rock Candy Land. We have just finished the sixth full length 117 album. Oh, I just got back the masters like literally 48 hours ago. So we've been double checking all of that stuff and riding around in the car, seeing if it bumps. Don't pretend like you don't do that. If you're in a band and you get your masters back, um, that's like one of our favorite parts of making new music. Anyway, the new album is done and we are getting together a release strategy and I can't wait to share some more stories about the creation of this record. I think this is probably one of the most honest albums that we've been able to write in the history of our band. So a a lot of you guys are following with us on this sort of pseudo spiritual life journey. This podcast chronicles a lot of our thoughts about where we've come from, from inside Protestant Christianity, leaving all of that. And I think for the first time ever, we actually were able to sit down and sort of think through a lot of the topics that we discuss on this podcast regularly. It has informed a lot of the writing process for this new album. So if you're a fan of the show or you're a fan of the band and you haven't done this, do me a favor, head over to 117isalive.com Sign up for our mailing list because we have a lot of things headed your way, a lot of information, music, videos, um, all this different content headed your way that we want you to be able to, to enjoy. And signing up for the mailing list is the best way to be able to do that. Huge hugs and high fives to everybody who is following along with the 117 discography on Spotify. Cannot thank you enough for that. And as always, a huge thank you to everybody who is purchasing anything from the Rock Candy Recordings online store. All of these different things that I've just mentioned, you can get to very quickly within the show notes. So yeah, now that all of that stuff is out of the way, today we have a really, really rad episode with a guy named Danny Papa who plays in a band called Element 101. This is like one of the late 90s, early 2000s pop rock punk bands. They are right there smack dab in the middle of the whole Tooth & Nail Records heyday. Somehow in the past month or so, I feel like I came across their profile or I saw them tagged in something and I had no idea that they were even entertaining doing music again. And so I thought maybe there's a story here. So I reached out and Danny and I got in touch. And so we, <laughs> we got on a FaceTime call and just kind of shot the breeze and talked about where they are, a little bit of the history of their band, the ups and downs of their career, and where they're headed now. And there's some exciting things happening over at the Element 101 camp. If you want to check out these records that they made, we have a link to that in the Spotify show notes. So yeah, it seems like it's a recurring theme that people who are in rock bands become educators once they get off the road and this story you will find to be no different. One of the kindest, most optimistic and caring people that we've had on the show. Cannot wait for you guys to hear this conversation with Danny Papa. So without further ado, let's do it.
Hey, man. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good. How are you? I, I'm doing good. I was like, give me 20 seconds. And then I literally, I turned around and just knocked a whole shelf of shit over <laughs> in the studio. And I was like, that is so, that's so indicative of my life. And the funny thing is like, I married someone who's just as clumsy as I am. Like if there's a thing to knock over onto something more expensive, I'll do, I'll find a way to do it. Yeah. So it's like the running joke is we can't have nice things just because of us. It's not even because of kids. Like it's right. just, right. we'll destroy it. Sure. Here we go. Okay. It's nice to finally get to hang out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks yeah. for having me. Dude, absolutely. What has your, uh, what's your day looked like so far? Uh, so I'm I'm actually a uh, 12 month um, employee of a school, um, but today, kind of a lame-o day, I, I took the day off to just to go get um, some doctor's appointments out of the way because when the school year starts, it's hard to get to the dentist and all that type of stuff. So yeah, um, I did hit up a record store though in between doctor's appointments and uh, found found a, a pretty cool seven inch um, the uh, the class drain and vein single. Yeah, yep. Dude, so. that's amazing. Do you find yeah. um do you find going into a record store now as like cathartic or exciting as you did like when you were doing it as a teen assuming that you did that as a teenager? <laughs> but, yeah, I absolutely did. So when I was when I was like 14, 15, I discovered this um this punk rock record store in the early 90s. That was probably more like mid 90s, I guess. Uh, in in uh, in New Jersey here, where we live in Montclair, is called Let It Rock, and um, I still have the same excitement because there's still so much more to discover and find. And um, you know, I've been really getting into a lot of the old, uh, you know, early '80s, late '70s, um, you know, bands that I love. Just getting into like a lot of their singles and listening to the B sides. Like, uh, obviously, you know, I'm a huge fan of Joshua Tree, but all of those singles um, that they released and all the B sides are so are so incredible. Um, yeah. I'm high end checking them out and uh you know so just you know looking in record stores for all that rare stuff you know that that's that's 30 years old now <laughs> or 40 years old and it's pretty cool to to you know to find it so yeah man it's still definitely exciting to to find all new types of stuff that that's awesome i i know that um i know that nostalgia can be a little bit of a drug but i do <laughs> i do really miss like going in because we had a couple of different record stores i grew up in greenville south carolina and we, I just remember like the smell of like old CDs, like thumbing sure. through CDs um, yeah. and blowing entire afternoons there between like the skate yep. park and the record store. Sure. <laughs> Those are like some of my best memories of, of growing up. Yeah, so. for sure. Where, uh, where about is Greenville um, as opposed to, I guess, in relation to Columbia? About two hours away. Okay. Yeah. So, so not far right next to Greenville is this little town called Spartanburg. And I remember the first time I heard about your band, I think I was in high, I think I was just started high school and I saw like a poster that you guys were going to be playing at this venue called Ground Zero okay. in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I don't know if that, if you remember that at all, because it's a, it's quite a forgettable area of the planet. It, it, but, it's a little, uh, it sounds somewhat familiar. Um, I do know that we we there were certain cities in in the country that we played a good amount, and um, Columbia was one of those cities that we I, I don't know what it was. We just we played a, a ton of shows there, and we always had a really great time. And it had been the first time we were ever in South Carolina was was that show. Um, do you remember who it was with? Was it um, was it maybe Hangnail and Undecided? Because that was the first time we went down south was with those those dudes. It might have been um, because I I feel like all of those like those tour packages from like the late 90s, early 2000s kind of kind of run together for me in my mind. Yeah, (laughs) So much to the point that there there's actually bands that I thought I had seen live and I just didn't because they just kind of fell under that whole like tooth and nail amalgamation (laughs) of stuff. Yeah. Um, Do you remember the venue that you played in Columbia? Yeah, we played. um, hmm, We played there with piebald um if you said the name it was the piebald recover tour we opened for those new bands. brooklyn tavern new brooklyn tavern yep <laughs> we, we we played there with piebald we played there another time with further sinks forever i be, i think we played columbia with branston and 238 um and then 
I have to say, one of the coolest shows we ever played was, <laughs> we totally didn't fit on the bill, um, but uh, our friends in Stretch Armstrong asked us to open up, um, I believe it was their Revolution Transmission uh, uh, CD release show. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, that wasn't, I don't know if that was in Columbia, but it was pretty close to it, I believe. So we opened up this, this hardcore show, <laughs> we opened and then it was... I think it was um, American Nightmare, Brothers Keeper. There was another another like metal hardcore band, and then Stretch Armstrong, and uh, it was their CD release show. Everyone was so super cool. I mean, we totally didn't fit on the bill. Everyone was so nice and generous, and um, they they actually thought it was pretty cool that a band like us actually played at that show. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh, I I I love that. So, yeah, we we have a we have we have a lot of we have a lot of fun memories of uh, South Carolina. So that weekend that we played Stretch's CD release show was a pretty crazy weekend. Uh, we didn't want to take our van and trailer because there's a ton of driving. But what we did was we drove, um, I believe this was in, well, I don't know when, it, I guess it was early July. We just, we rented a van, threw everything in the van, and we drove from Jersey to Myrtle Beach straight. Uh, <laughs> and, and opened for Stretch and Newfound Glory at the House of Blues. Yeah. Then got in the van, didn't sleep, drove all the way to Birmingham. Alabama the next day to play Furnace Fest. <laughs> oh my God. Um, we got a hotel, we supped a little bit, and then we drove back to Columbia to play Stretch's CD release show, uh, album release show on that Sunday. So we went Myrtle to Birmingham, oh, Myrtle on sa- uh, Friday, Birmingham Saturday, and then uh, back to Columbia on Sunday. Um, so that, that was a whirlwind weekend, but it was, it was, it was awesome. Oh my gosh. That that's bringing back so many memories. Yeah. That, so like, I don't know how extensively you guys hit the road or had right. like these run. I remember, I remember being so confused, like when we got our first booking agent that like, yeah. oh, oh, it's their job to like book shows, but it's almost like they just did not have any concept of like yeah. geography or anything. Right. It's like, we can't, we, we cannot go from Florida to Utah right. in a yeah. day. Like, I, I don't know why you think that's going to happen, yeah. but did you guys right. have any situations like that where it was just like, all, like near impossible to pull off? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely had, uh, we, yeah, we definitely had some, some situations that, uh, <laughs> that we ran into. Um, I would say as far as driving goes, uh, when we did that, that summer tour opening for, um, Juliana Theory and Cody in Cambria, yeah. uh, Juliana Theory was on a, it was in a bus. So, you know, obviously, you know, when, when you're in a van and trailer and you're on a tour that's routed for a bus, there's going to be a ton of driving. So I think it was like, like maybe 10 days straight where it was like play pack up get in the get in the van drive all night get to the next city try to find somewhere to sleep for a little bit and then play and do the same thing over again so they were like you know eight to ten hour maybe even 12 hour drives in between um some of those shows but it's all worth it man you know like we 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 never mind we we were like a big family and uh we loved being in the van together and um we had so much fun so you know it was it was all good that's awesome did you guys have any things that you turned to to stay awake Uh, on those long drives (laughs) nick our drummer he actually claims that he can't sleep in moving objects so we would keep each other up um obviously listen to music uh keeping windows open drinking coffee i mean all all, you know all the above but uh yeah i mean yeah we were just always we'd we'd help each other out um I, i know there were a lot of times i was trying to stay awake for nick and i would doze off and that (laughs) riding shotgun but yeah um yeah you could tell the progression of our band like the the mental health of our band by how we dealt with longer drives like the older like the longer that we were doing it when we first started out it was like let's get some gatorade Uh, and you know maybe a couple of energy drinks and then that turned into like is there like are is there anything stronger than red bull yeah and so like then it turns into like monster energy drinks and then it's not just that it's also like the oral fixation of like sunflower seeds you just have like this whole smack like the whole dash of the van of every van we ever had was like filled with gross spit covered sunflower seeds i mean the van is a gross thing to live in sure like that slowly turned into like cigarettes and did so and so have did so and so have like uh, any did you guys pick up anything before we left and well maybe just, at no point in the history of our band were we ever like man we should really just pull over and sleep <laughs> i don't know why it never occurred to us to do that 
Yeah. Like, yeah. but anyway, <laughs> what year did you officially, did you guys officially start Element 101 and were you in it from day one or did you join later? Yeah. So, um, actually Chrissy and I started the band, um, in 97 and, um, you know, we, we were just good friends and, um, then Chris Mazzone, who's our guitar player, he actually started um, playing drums and our, our friend Chris Lindstrom played bass when Chris, and then we decided Chris was a way better guitar player than he was a drummer. So we had a friend of ours play drums. So Chris was obviously the guitar player. Um, so we had two guitars and and then when Lindstrom left, uh, Sal is Chris's best friend, grew up right next door to Chris. Um, Sal's an incredible bass player. It was a no brainer for him to join. Yeah. Um, and then Craig, I think was going off to college. So we had to replace him on drums. This is all before tooth and nail um, days. And then, uh, you know, Nick joined and then pretty much around the time Nick joined is when we um, wrote and recorded our full length future plans on this side. So, so um, what is this like 97, 98? So the band started in 97 and then we put out, we wrote and recorded future plans in 99. Okay, cool. Tell yeah. me about, tell me about that situation. I've, I feel like, the ways in which bands get discovered now is is almost like a completely different universe from how they sure. how it used to happen or at least how it happened for us right. um so like walk me through how you guys come into knowing what tooth and nail is being offered yeah. a contract like what's all that yeah. nitty gritty i would say i was probably the only member of the band that even that knew tooth and nail i would say Nick, Chrissy, Chris, Sal, they all found out about Tooth and Nail and, and those types of bands, really, for me. Yeah. Um, I think I discovered Tooth and Nail from a friend at school who had a few of their early albums, and I you know, I thought it was pretty cool, so I started listening to it. Obviously, when I heard MXPX, that, that was the, the game changer. <laughs> of course. Um, but, but you know what it was? It was like, you know, I was discovering punk rock around the time and discovered, you know, um, you know, before that, I was, I think I was just more into a lot of, like, the alternative, and, you know, because it was like the early 90s, and I was... I was a high school kid, right? So who wasn't into Nirvana and Stone Temple Pilots? Yeah. And those yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a lot of my friends obviously started riding skateboards and discovering punk and hardcore through them and, you know, getting into like punk bands like Face to Face and News for a Name and then, um, you know, found them XPX and I was like, wow, this, this, this band's, you know, obviously cool and got into them. And that's how I kind of got, you know, knew about Tooth and Nail. Um, and then when we started playing, we started, we played, you know, just local Jersey shows and basements and people's backyards and fire halls and, you know, hall type shows. Um, but then we, we got into like the Philadelphia scene with some of the bands like the Huntington's and 121, Speedy Delivery, mm. Bills, a lot of those those bands in that area. And we, we would play with them a good amount. So when we were going to record um, our EP before Future Plans, and we recorded it with um, Cliffy from the Huntington's. Yeah. And uh, he was like, he's like, let me see if my good friend Scott would be willing to, to put this out on his label. And we we're like, really? <laughs> that would be amazing. And uh, Scott <laughs> runs burnt toast vinyl um he agreed to put it out he pressed i think he made a press like a thousand cds or something like that yeah and, and um in the meantime what happened was chris mazone and i were at uh the asbury park warp tour this was probably maybe 98 and uh i went up to mike herrera just so randomly <laughs> and, and I was like hey mike here, here's my band's um ep we're, we're, we're writing a full length would you be interested in producing it and he looked at me and he goes yeah. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Having not heard it, like yeah. it just occurs to him, like I, maybe I could produce. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. How cool is that? Just some random kid walks up to him and is like, Hey man, would you want to produce our album? And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, look, we're, we're in New Jersey. He's in, he's in Seattle, the opposite part, you know, part of the, the country. And yeah. And uh, he gave me his number and we just communicated back and forth and we set up studio time, Scott Hatch, um, you know, uh, agreed to the, you know, the recording budget and Mike flew out and, uh, we recorded in, in Pennsylvania. He was with us for, I think it was seven days. Um, we pretty much did everything on that album in seven days besides mixing, mixing happened after, and then you know, we would send them the mixes afterward. Um, so, so we put out, um, future plans on the side on burnt toast vinyl. Um, you know, we just were playing as much as we possibly could going anywhere. We, you know, we, we, we could, um, do you, then, do you remember what the recording budget for that was? Oh, uh, that was maybe like maybe four grand for the whole record. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, that that's kind of amazing. Yeah. Like yeah. And that's, so, that's, that's all the studio time. That's Mike's fee. That's mixing, mastering. Like, but, 
Um, I would say Mike's, I forgot what we paid him. We paid him a little bit. It really was nothing. I mean, you know, we obviously played it, it paid for his plane ticket out. Sure. Um, the studio was this studio in the Poconos, Pennsylvania, where, um, the, we all stayed there. It was like the studios in the basement and then it was a house upstairs. Yeah. Mike, um, stayed up like the second floor. Then we all stayed on the first floor. And then, uh, you know, so that, that was, that was pretty cool. So then what happened was, um, we put that out in, I guess it was a summer of 99 and my uh my really good friend uh marty love who is the current bass player of zeo he was on tour with the juliana theory and uh they were up in seattle they went out to dinner with the tooth and nail crew and uh marty sat next to billy power and marty said to billy power hey what are you you know what are some bands that you're looking to sign like what, what's on your radar right now yeah and billy and um I'm, my, my number one thing is i want to find a, a, a pop punk band with a girl singer <laughs> and, uh, and Marty, he's like, you have to check out my buddy's band. So he gave him future plans and decided it. And Billy sent us an email and he was like, I really like your band. I want to talk to you. I want to meet you. Um, I remember bringing it to the guys and saying like, this record label is interested in talking with us. How ridiculous is this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did that feel? So, uh, I mean, it, yeah, it felt amazing to think that someone was interested in investing in us. Um, it was great. It, it was awesome. And, uh, so that was, I think like July and then purple door festival, which took place in Pennsylvania was in August. And, um, I guess Billy, I don't know if it was Billy power or Brandon asked if we could, um, open, like, I think it was like two days. So we, they asked us to put us like in the er earliest slot, like before the first band of the day. Yeah. I think we played at like 9 AM and, um, they wanted to see us live, you know, first. So, um, what happened was we played and then after we played, um, we, we started talking to Brandon and some of the other tooth and nail guys. And uh, Brandon's like, he's like, let's do a photo shoot. And we're like, okay. So just, <laughs> just right then and there. Yeah. We, I mean, we cha obviously had to change our t shirts because we we're slow. <laughs> mess. This is um, so fly but, by night. This is the most fly by night story I've heard so yeah, far. So we, it was like at this like Mennonite school was the the festival, and um, we were in, we went inside the school. We took so the the pictures that are in future plans are all from from Purple Door and from whatever we did after we played, um, you know, with with Brandon. So. Uh, yeah. And then he, you know, he wanted to re-release, um, future plans, which, um, which we were fine with. And so just remixed and mastered it and, uh, you know, and then, you know, re released that. And at that time we were in the process of writing, um, the song for stereo girl. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so who in your, who in your, in your band did most of the writing or does most of the writing? So, uh, Christmas zone, I would say writes the majority of, of guitar parts, you know, Nick and Sal write their bass part, bass and drum parts. Um, a lot of the way it would work is Chris would write guitar. We would jam it out, um, record a really rough demo and then give it to Chrissy. And then she would write her melodies. There was like one or two songs on Stereo Girl where Chrissy wrote a few chords for a few things that she had a melody for. Nick, our drummer, wrote, I think, one or two songs on each album. Um, you know, but, but the writing process was very collaborative. Like Nick would come up with a riff, show it to Chris, and then they would, you know, collaborate on that. Um, I, I really wasn't part of the uh, the writing process at all. I was more of the, uh, like the band dad, like taking care of all the shows <laughs> and talking to the record label and, and yeah. merch and, and doing all the, like the business end of things. And they took care of really the, the writing and the, and the creative aspects. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> Chrissy is Chrissy might be the I would say she's she's a classically trained musician where none of us in the band are she <laughs> she plays the harp so she like you know I mean that's a really complicated what the hell? yeah I yeah. had no idea yeah so you know her her music background is 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 amazing and um so when when she wrote a few things you know it was pretty cool because you know she was applying that like classically trained you know musicianship to you know to some of those those uh, punk songs yeah man that's that's so fascinating do you yeah um do you remember what that what that scenario looked like with tooth and nail do you remember anything that was in that contract sure. Yeah, we signed. Um, we fought. We signed a five album deal. You thought uh, you did, or you? No, 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 no oh. we did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <We> signed, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no. We, no, I know we did. Yeah, we signed a. Um, we signed a five album deal. Future plans counted as one of them. Um, so after future plans, obviously we were on the hook to write four and tooth and nail owned 51% of our publishing mm. and we 
we owned 49%. And as I'm trying to think what else was involved in that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. I think it was a pretty standard contract that they offered a lot of bands then. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we weren't we weren't really in the place um, or the position of we didn't really have much leverage in negotiating, um, you know, whereas obviously some other bands they were really seeking may may have. You know, so yeah. Did it feel validating to find yourself on a label? I mean, how how old are you when this is happening? So I was the oldest um, in two thousand. I was uh, so in two thousand when we signed. I was um, I was twenty two, and uh, Nick and Nick and um, Nick, our drummer and Sal, our bass player, were still in high school, mm. and he was nineteen. Chris Mazone was nine, or yeah, about nineteen, nineteen twenty, something like around that age. So yeah, I mean, we were, we were, yeah, we were really young. I mean, for the most part, still kids. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it was amazing. I, I think, you know, I've listened to a ton of, of podcasts and, and, and so on. And, you know, the way I feel about everything regarding Tooth and Nail is I have, I have a ton of gratitude. I mean, I look at it this way. We were, you know, a band from New Jersey that was willing to work hard and, and they were willing to invest in us. And, you know, we met some of the greatest people that we've ever met in our lives because of, of being on that label. Um, people that we're still friends with today. Like I'm still really great friends with Billy power. I think he's an awesome dude. You know, just and a lot of the bands we met on the label we're, we're still, we still keep in touch with and, and uh, which is, which is awesome. And uh, I, I would say, you know, the most important thing for us is, you know, they gave us a chance and they, you know, they, they took a chance on us and obviously they didn't make money back on us. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the other thing is, you know, I think when we look back at it, I would say collectively, as far as like punk bands go, yeah. I would say, um, all and descendants, um, are probably our collective favorite band. And mm. because of being on tooth and nail, we were able to record two albums with them. And even more importantly than recording with them, uh, we became friends with them. And you know, it's not like every day you, you could become friends with people that you look up to as legends, you know, and uh, we got to know them, you know, in, in a really personal way. And, uh, you know, um, I saw Stefan about a year ago when they came to Jersey, which was great to see him. Yeah. Chrissy, yeah. Uh, Chrissy keeps in touch with Bill. Um, Chrissy and Bill had a, had a really, um, special connection actually, um, mm. when boarded out there. And, uh, th those dudes are just, they're some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. Is this out, is this out in Colorado? Yeah. The... Fort Cop, yep. Yeah. yeah. What's the name oh, of that studio? It's uh, the Blasting Room. The Blasting Room. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So but what happened with that was, um, I guess, you know, so we put out future plans and we were talking about, you know, the next record, which became Stereo Girl. And Billy Power was asking where, where would we like to record? And we told him that, you know, obviously the Blasting Room would be our number one choice. Yeah. So he, I, I, I can't remember which band. It might have been Slick Shoes. There, there, was a, there was a tooth and nail band prior to us going there that Bill and Stefan recorded. I think it might have been Slick Shoes. And, um, so Tooth and Nail started sending like some of their their pop punk stuff to to Bill. Yeah. And so Billy sent him future plans. Bill Stevenson was like, "Ah, oh, I, I would love to record this band." So, dude, I will never forget <laughs> this. I, that has so, to feel awesome, dude. So I I had I had an answering machine because obviously this is what two thousand. It goes right? like so, to tape answering machine. Uh yeah, like a yeah yeah exactly okay. yeah. I don't I don't have it any longer, but I'll never forget coming home, hitting play, had a message. And the message was, hi, Danny, this is Bill Stevenson <laughs> I to you about recording your band. Give me a call back. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, how is this happening right now? Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> we, uh, I called him back and, and he was like, I'd love to record, you know, record you guys. So then we demoed a few songs, sent them out to him. And, uh, and, and he was like, let's do it. So, um, you know, we set a time and, and, uh, we went out, I think stereo girl, I think we were there for two and a half weeks. Mm. I think, I think it was, um, yeah, it might've been like 18 days, something like that. Wow. Do you, do you remember what, <clears throat> do you remember what the budget was for that record? I think that, I think that record was uh, maybe 11, 11 and a half, maybe, maybe 12. Now he, here's the thing though. Like we, you know, we had a fly out there, right? So, um, the five of us flying out. So, you know, plane tickets and, and all of that. So, you know, it was obviously more, but I think the recording itself was maybe around 11 or 12. 
from what I remember. Wow. See, that that's interesting to me because earlier in the conversation, you were like, I, I'm pretty sure that Tooth & Nail didn't make any money off of us. And then I think, right. yeah, but with a recording budget that like even by today's standards and bands don't have budgets now especially like they used to or there's just not as many like indie labels that are made that are putting enough bread on the table to, you know to be able to like foot budgets and stuff but even that i have a really hard time believing that it putting your record out was not lucrative to some degree like I, maybe nobody got rich off of it right. but it's hard to imagine spending that little on a record and having national distribution under yeah. tooth and nail, like at that time and, yeah. and not at least getting in the black. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they, they put a lot of money into, um, promoting the record and, um, you know, so I, I'm not really sure what was spent on, you know, promotion behind it all. But, uh, you know, I think we got an advance maybe on that. Maybe it was like a, maybe like a $5,000 advance that obviously went into like, you know, van and trailer and, and that type of stuff. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's cool. That's awesome. I remember when we got our first advance, I uh, called up a friend of mine who I knew was selling a JCM 2000. And like right. up until that point, I just had these like shitty solid state guitar amps. Yeah. Sure, sure. And I was like, this is going to be like my pro level, yeah. <laughs> like awesome guitar head. And now looking back, it's like, I don't even know if I would like track with a JCM 2000. It's just like super <laughs> brittle and kind of weird sounding. But yeah, at the time yeah. I was completely smitten with it. And I was like, I think I gave him like 700 bucks for it out of the, just, yeah. It's just like getting, getting what is essentially like a really small chunk of money. But like when you're, a teenager that's the most money you've ever seen in your life. Oh, sure. And, and you think like, oh my gosh, I'm going to totally be taken care of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably the farthest thing from the truth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> about what's happening. Right. Um, this is this would have been your second record that Tooth & Nail put out, but your first one right. that like they put the bill for everything. And um, right. so you put that one out and then all like what is it less than a year or just at a year later you end up putting your next one out yeah we um so i'm trying to remember now you know what you know what ended up happening we recorded stereo girl in 2000 in may of 2000 but it didn't come out until february of 2001 um because the re-release of future plans came out in 2000 so they didn't want the releases to be too close so even though we recorded it in may of 2000 we kind of sat on it for a little while yeah. Um, right. And then, so we, so that, so we recorded in May of 2000 and then we recorded, uh, more than motion in March of 2002. So because stereo girl came out a little later, it seems like, you know, it was like one album a year, but really yeah. the recording was, you know, almost two years in me you know, two years in between the recordings. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. So you kind of like start, you, you kind of front loaded your discography there for a second yeah. and they just kind of staggered yeah. the yeah. release. That's interesting. Right. Right. Um, tell me about this the last record that you made as a band. Sure. <laughs> well, um, again, you know, I, I feel like we were really young when we recorded um, Stereo Girl. Like I said, you know, and Chrissy and Chris maybe were 20 years old, right? And uh, Nick and Sal were 19. And, you know, for me, like looking back at it, I feel like it's a very mature record considering how young we were. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, I think Chrissy did a phenomenal job on her lyrics and, um, you know, for obviously, you know, for her age at the time. And so uh, between Stereo Girl and, and More Than Motion, we, we matured a lot um, as I think, I think we matured a lot from being on the road. We matured a lot from the band that we became friends with. And, and um, but more importantly, I think the music that we were listening to changed a lot as well. Um, and I think that really, be, that really influenced what we did on, on More Than Motion. So More Than Motion um, I think was a departure from stereo girl in a lot of ways, especially listening back now. Um, it was slower, darker, obviously more experimental on certain songs. More moody. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, a little heavier. We, we started experimenting with um, a bunch of different tones and, and pedals and tuning and, and all of that type of stuff. Um, Chrissy, Chrissy really grew a lot as a singer. Um, you know, she, she changed some of her vocal style a little bit, you know, something that we ran into as a band was, um, we didn't sound like anyone. And mm. I think sometimes people didn't really know how to take us because, you know, the music sounds like pop punk, but the vocals don't sound like your typical, you know, um, kid who's trying to sound like Mike Carrera or, you know, um, whoever that might be. And, 
you know, so, so the vocals were never really aggressive. So I think on, on more than motion, um, you know, and, and that was something that we heard a lot, you know, that, um, a lot of times live couldn't hear the vocals. And I think Chrissy began to, you know, really, um, experiment and grow more as a singer and, you know, started getting into a little bit more of a gruffer sound, which I think some people liked and some people, you know, didn't, didn't like as much either. Looking back at it, I, I kind of think that maybe we, um, needed an album in between those two albums to kind of bridge. Cause I, I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're different. I mean, I, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud of them and, and I wouldn't change anything on them. I just think that maybe, you know, maybe there had to be some music, whether it was an EP or something that kind of sat in between those albums to kind of bridge the gap. Mm, uh, yeah. You know, so, but, um, yeah, I, B- Bill and Stefan were a little, a little um, baffled at a few times in in the studio recording more than motion about uh, some of the things we were experimenting with. (laughs) (laughs) Was that, was that really fun for you? Because I know that you, um, I know that you mentioned before that you, you weren't necessarily like one of the front runners of like the, the songwriting or creative process, but it, it did sound like you might've enjoyed the experimentation parts of making that record do you do you oh, remember yeah. enjoying that at all oh yeah for sure yeah i mean i you know we started you know we, we uh, like i said we started dabbling with like a bunch of different pedals you know i uh, before before those songs i didn't really have a pedal board right and now i have a pedal board and chris chris's pedal board like tripled from what he had and uh, <laughs> I thought all the experimentation was really fun and, and it, and it was different, you know, and, and, uh, I absolutely, I, it, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun. And I think playing those more than motion songs were, were great. They were, they were just a lot of fun songs to play live. And so, yeah, we, we, we really had a blast, uh, you know, with, with all of that. And I, I think Chris is such a, I feel like he's such an innovative um, musician. Those are very kind things to say about your, about your bandmates. <laughs> yeah. I honestly, man, we're, we're, we're like a big family. You know, we, uh, we, we had a rule that, um, if one, if one person didn't want to do it any longer then that, that was the end of the band. And, um, you know, we would never replace anyone and, and that's, you know, and we, we've held true to that. And, uh, you know, now, like I mentioned in, in the message that, um, pretty crazy, but over the last like few weeks, we, um, we, we've been talking and hanging out and we're, we're we've decided to write some, some new music. And, uh, again, it's, you know, it's the five of us. And if one person didn't want to do it, we, we wouldn't do it. We believe a lot in, in just being, you know, united and, and being a family. So um, I'm actually really excited, man. Cause, uh, I never thought this would happen. I really never thought that we would ever, you know, do anything again. You know, we played our last show in, in October of 2002 mm. and uh, never once have we talked about a reunion or anything like that up until literally four weeks ago. What, what prompted and, that discussion? Honestly, man, it is so out of left field. So I, I guess the, the background on that is I realized about three months ago that stereo girl next year will, will turn 20 years old. And, and I was like, ah, it would be so, in my mind, I was like, ah, it would be so cool if, if we were able to, re- you know, release some new music just to, you know, for the heck of it. Right. I was a little nervous. To, I was nervous to bring it up to Chris and nervous to bring it up to Chrissy. Um, Chrissy recently had a, I just didn't know how they felt about it. You know, I didn't know if, if, if they would be into it. Um, and, and it was more or less, I wanted them to be into it. I didn't want them to, to, to do it just because I was asking, right? Like I wanted them to really genuinely and authentically want it. Right. Do do you think that they would just appease you if you, if you asked, if you said, uh, Hey, I'm kind of interested in this. Like, what do you guys think? Is that, it sounds like that might've been a fear that you had that maybe they would just be, I don't know. Yeah. I I just didn't want to be the case. I, 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 felt like if we ever again, it would be because the five of us genuinely wanted to be together again and, and make music. So, um, so I just want to, I guess in my own heart, wanted to know that that's how they felt as well. Um, so Chrissy had her baby, um, in, uh, the beginning of April. So we were, we were talking a few weeks after that. And, um, you know, she was telling me how, uh, Chrissy's actually studying for her PhD right now. And, uh, <laughs> Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, she filled out an application and I guess in the application, they wanted to know like, you know, how come she wasn't in school for a number of years. So she talked about being in the band and that kind of prompted her to get back listening to some of the element stuff. And, um, <laughs> so she kind of, she, she was kind of going down her own like nostalgic road, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. And, but I never, I didn't bring it up to her at that point. So, um, about maybe about a month ago. Yeah. About a month ago, six weeks ago, 
Um, her and her husband, Frank, came over with the baby, and Nick came by, and um, I was outside grilling, and I mentioned it to Nick. I said, hey, man, what do you think about trying to write and record some new music? And Nick was like, oh, I'm totally down. Let's, let's, you know, let's do it. I'm like, so how do we approach this with Chrissy and Chris? So, <laughs> uh, we still didn't bring it up, and then... Two weeks after that, I'm outside doing yard work. I come in, I have a text message from Chris Mazzone, and it literally said, he's like, dude, I just turned 40. I think I'm having somewhat of a midlife crisis. I would, I would love nothing more than to write and record a new element song. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? So I, I texted him back. I told him what I've been thinking, and he was like totally blown away. So I texted Nick, and I was like, dude, did you talk to Chris? Did you tell him what, um, what you and I were talking about? And he's like, no, I haven't talked to him thing that he was thinking. And so I talked to him on a Monday, I gave Chrissy a call and she was down and then Chris called Sal and he was down. So like two weeks ago, we all met up at Sal's house and, um, we had lunch together and, uh, you know, I would say that was only the third time that the five of us were together since 2002. Um, Oh my gosh. Yeah. We were together in 2008 and Nick's wedding. We were together at at my wedding in 2016. And then, um, we were together that, that, um, you know, that Sunday. So tell me how that, that tell me how that felt to have all uh, of you guys back in the same place together. Amazing. I, I I'm, I'm still like, I'm, I'm still blown away by it all, man. It, it's, it's like I said, it's out of left field. It, it's total shock, um, for me. And, um, you know, I started like that Instagram page. I started that a, maybe two years ago. And the reason simply was just because, you know, we existed before YouTube, social media, MySpace, iTunes, um, all of that stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. So we never, we never had access to any of those, those resources. And, um, you know, I have a bunch of pictures and a bunch of stuff and I was like, you know what, maybe, maybe there'll be two or three people who care. Right. So let me just throw it out there and, you know, there'll be hopefully someone who appreciates it. And that's kind of got, you know, some of the, obviously the nostalgia worked up too, but honestly, man, the way we feel about it is we just want to have fun. Um, we have no expectations. We're, we're doing it really just to be creative, to be together again. And really, you know, because we love music and, and we want to, you know, we, we just want to do it, you know, as a family once again. And, uh, you know, uh, we have, again, no, no expectations, just, just fun. Okay. So you say no expectations, but part of what makes these kinds of things exciting is yeah. sort of the internal daydreaming that you do about them. So I, I have to imagine, cause I mean, I can tell how excited you are. I love it. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Um, <laughs> But like, so if you, if right now, before you guys have gone into the studio, you don't have anything tracked yet. You don't have any new no. music. So I'm, I'm sure that like sifting through demos and going through that whole like pre-production process is going to take you guys some time. But do you have an idea right now of like a possible direction or is there yeah. like an idea in your mind of what you want this to sound like? So it, it's interesting when you have, when you have chemistry with someone I believe that that chemistry really never leaves. Right. We had chemistry as a band, you know, 18 years ago. Um, and this is an example of that chemistry is, so I said to Nick, I, I literally said, I, if we were to write new stuff to me, it should be more in the vein of stereo girl, you know, with, with a hint of, of more than motion at, at times. Um, and Nick was like, yeah, he's like, I, I agree. So when I spoke to Chris, Chris literally said to me, and again, we haven't, we haven't spoken. We were just kind of in our own heads. Yeah. Chris said, to me, he goes, dude, he goes, I really think that the direction that we take should be stereo girl, just way better. And I was like, that is exactly what I <laughs> did two weeks ago. And that's exactly what I've been thinking. So it kind of goes back to what I said to you before about, you know, kind of songs that would sit in between stereo girl and, um, and more than motion, um, I think is, is probably the direction we're going to go in. And, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I would say that we're all suckers for pop songs. So mm. I think, you know, they're just going to be pop, poppy and catchy songs that, um, so I, I think that's really going to be more of the direction is more of a stereo girl vibe, uh, than, uh, than, than more than most. I love that. That's, that's, yeah. that's super exciting before we get like too happy about everything <laughs> happening yeah. in your life right now, because yeah. you got a lot of really fun cylinders firing right now. Um, sure. One of the things that I really like asking people is, do you remember the absolute worst moment that you ever had in your band? Yeah. Like, oh, I, okay, without a doubt, I know exactly the day. Take me there. So, um, so one of the, I think one of the areas that we 
And when I look back and, he, and when we, we were well aware of this was the fact that we were from New Jersey and you get this as, you know, being an East coast kid, getting to the West coast is really difficult. Yeah. Right. So we, we did a full tour to support future plans. We never made it to California or the West coast. I mean, we did a ton of touring down the East coast, Midwest, but you know, getting out to California was always rough. And we, so we didn't get out to California to support um, stereo girl, which was definitely a mistake. So in the summer preceding, um, more than motion. So the summer of 2002, we were on, uh, us and 238 were opening for Coheed and Cambria and Julian. That tour started, um, in New York or at East coast and then was going West. And there were 10 shows on the West coast. So there was mm-hmm. Seattle port. And then there were, I believe, um, seven shows in California and then like one in, and it was going to end in Arizona. I believe is what the the routing was. So, um, so, you know, we did the whole tour out, we get up to Seattle and, uh, this was August of 2002 and Nick, our drummer after the Seattle show says, um, he's like, guys, he's like, I'm not really not feeling too well. I have, I have a really bad headache and, uh, just not feeling well. And Nick, Nick's the type of guy, like he's a super tough guy, like never takes medicine. Like, you know, he toughs it out. So, I remember I went and bought him like next door at some drugstore or whatever, bought him some Advil, gave him Advil. Um, that night he went and stayed with Roy Culver in Seattle uh, from Tooth and Nail. And the rest of us went with 238 and we stayed with, I believe it was Annika and maybe Amanda from, um, from Tooth and Nail. And they were like, maybe they're, they were outside this, the city of Seattle. Yeah. So we stayed there. And the next morning he calls us and he's like, he's like, guys, I'm really not feeling well. We went to go pick him up um, that night. The show was in Portland. He's in the back of the van and, and he like threw up all over the van. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So we're like, wow. He, you know, he's doing well. So I, we went to the university hospital in Seattle. It was maybe like maybe 11 o'clock. Bring him in. Um, he ended up staying in the hospital for a few hours um, with. So Nick and, and uh, I'm sorry, Nick was there and then Sal and Chris stayed with him. And me and Chrissy and our roadie Vinny drove to Portland and Billy Power drove the three of them down to Portland. So the hospital there, uh, they gave Nick fluids like IV. Um, they, they, they just said he had like flu-like symptoms. Flu-like symptoms. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So they, Billy Power drives them down. We get to Portland. We're hanging out at the, the show. We're waiting for them to get there. They get there and Nick's like, dude, he's like, I'm really sick. I'm really sick. And so at this point, it's like 11, 11 at night. So we're like, all right, let's go to the hospital. Now, Portland was a city that um, we never played before. Uh, we didn't know anyone there. We didn't know our way around that city. So somehow we got directions. I don't even remember to some the, lo- the near hospital. We bring him to the hospital. When he gets there, he literally is crawling on his hands and knees into the emergency room. Um, oh my like God. writhing in pain. So we, um, you know, it now at this point it's like midnight, we're waiting in the emergency room. It's like, you know, midnight turns to, to 3 AM four. So they said to us, they're like, you guys can go sleep in your van. If you want, you could just park in, in the parking lot here. So we went and slept in the van. Um, and it was like six, six, six o'clock, six thirty. get a knock on the van and it's a doctor. And the doctor says, I got, I got pretty bad news for you guys. Um, He's like, your buddy has meningitis. I never heard of that before at that point. Yeah. He, he's like, he has meningitis. There's three types of meningitis. Two are highly contagious. One is not contagious. If he has one of those two that are contagious, you all are going to have. Um, oh and my I re- God. <laughs> yeah. I remember staring at the ceiling of that van. Like, this is an absolute nightmare. Uh, like, what is going on? Right. So we go in and, and he is on morphine, the painkiller morphine. And he is, he is literally like screaming in pain while he's on morphine. That's how much pain he was in. Oh my God. Yeah. So we, um, the two thirty eight guys came to the hospital before they were leaving. Cause I think that next day was a day off. Yeah. They came and we just had the realization that, you know, we were going to pull off the tour and because Nick had to stay in the hospital, I believe he had to stay in the hospital for maybe it was a week and then he couldn't fly for two weeks. So his mom ended up flying out. And, uh, I remember like standing there with the two thirty eight guys and like everything kind of like hit me. Yeah. And I, I remember I just started bawling. Like I, I felt horrible for Nick. Mm. I felt like all the hard work that we put in, you know, obviously, you know, was ending in before us. Um, I, I would say part of, part of myself, like I was, I was afraid, I was afraid for him because I, you know, I learned like how serious meningitis is. Like there's, I feel you know, people die from it and it's, 
it's so serious that you know, I know in New Jersey that you know when you go to college you have to get a uh, a vaccine for it. I don't know if yeah. that's across the country or not, but um, you know, so it, it's a really serious thing, and um, that that was just it, it was just heartbreaking. And um, you know, we we looked at our cash box. We had a few hundred dollars in there, and and you know, we decided to <laughs> uh, we decided that we had to leave him with his with his mom who, who was with him. And we just drove home. We drove from, I mean, you really can't drive really much further than Portland, Oregon to the North Jersey, right? Oh so, my God, no. <laughs> Yeah, That's a pilgrimage. We, we drove like the 55 hours straight home. And uh, yeah, that was um, that was a huge, huge bummer. I would say that is that's one of the darkest moments of uh, of the band, um, for sure. You know, he ended up obviously, you know, he, he recovered, um, which is which is amazing. Uh, because that's a really, really serious illness. And, uh, luckily he didn't have the one that was, that, that was contagious. Right. So luckily. Um, <laughs> we, we, we were fortunate with that, but that, that, that was really the beginning of the end for the band because, uh, you know, we, we got home and we were super, you know, discouraged and disappointed about all of it. Um, so that was the end of August. Um, we recorded, like I said, uh, March of 2002, more than motion. And Billy power literally said, he's like, He's like, you take the pick. When do you want the release date to be? And we decided that the release date would be early September. You know, Tooth and Nail was planning on, you know, really hitting up college radio with um, the song, The Fragile, the third song on the album. And, you know, we had this whole plan in place. And I mean, you know how it is, right? The first week of sales for a band is, is what is the indicator for, you know, the size of the band, right? So, you know, we, we had you know, we had an idea of what we were hoping to hit, you know, to the nail was putting a lot into prom promoting it. We were putting a lot in, we had a, we had a bunch of shows lined up. Um, you know, we were putting together a street team, just friends we had in different cities that were helping us promote it. And the release date, um, was September, uh, September 11, uh, 2002. So that Tuesday we go to the store, we're like pumped to find it. We go to the store, we can't find it. Our friends can't find it. We start getting phone calls. I call Bill <laughs> And Billy Power says, says, Danny boy, the car crash has happened. And more or less what he was saying was, you know, the, the crash has happened. There's nothing you can do about it now. The, uh, the music industry decided last minute to uh, postpone and delay all releases on that day um, in honor of the one-year anniversary of 9-11. So what happened to that, the release of that record, there's all different release dates. Like there was not, there wasn't one solid release date. So in some parts of the country, it came out two weeks later. Um, in other parts of the country, it came out a week prior. The distribution of the record got all messed up and um, it was an absolute disaster. Like, like Billy Power said, it was a car crash, right? So, so between, so that, so Nick meningitis dropping off the tour, the biggest and best tour we were ever on. Uh, <laughs> I would say the most important tour that we were ever on. Mm you know, as far as cultivating a fan base, then, you know, that was August, that disappointment and, and heartbreak. And then in September, the heartbreak of, um, you know, the, the album being completely, you know, messed up, you know, I think we began to look at things and we began to say, you know, we, we've worked our asses off for, you know, many years now. And, um, I think it was just time to move on in life, you know? Mm. And uh, so, you know, we each, we each took it, you know, to heart in our own way, but, uh, you know, it, it was, it was tough. Um, so I would say obviously Nick getting sick and then the, um, you know, we, we, we really believed in that record and put our heart and soul into it. And, and we really wanted it to, to get out there. And, mm. and then, you know, when it, you know, when it was all messed up, it, it, it was kind of like a confirmation. I felt like, you know, like maybe it's time to just pull it quits and go in different directions in life, you know, of everybody so. in your band who, would you believe to have maybe taken your band's breakup the hardest or who do you think it might've been the hardest for? Um, I know that might be a little I, bit of a complicated question, but <laughs> I would say, I think it was hard for all of us because more important than the band was the family. And it, it was like a, it, it's like a, you know, a band's a relationship and, and that relationship was broken. And so it's like you're, you're dealing with a breakup. So I think it was hard on all, all five of us. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone, I don't think it was easy for any of anyone. Um, you know, and we all, we all separated and, and, you know, what happened was a week after that. Um, so we became like super close friends with further seems forever. They were like our, um, our best friend band. They, uh, th those dudes showed up at, at my parents' house and they were like, let's go, Danny boy, you're going on the road. And I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, 
they took me on the that newfound glory tour with them uh, and then i ended up touring with them for a year which was amazing so that really helped i guess help me get over things um you know just being with another band yeah. it's you know connected to music i had so much fun with those dudes i don't think i ever laughed more in my life than than with those guys <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I love them like like brothers, and uh, that that you know, looking back at life, uh, the, the, that's some of the best times I ever had was with, with those guys on that tour. So I think that really helped me. Um, so did they have you? Did they bring you on because she, they knew you as being took, such a good know, band dad? What's that? Do you feel like they 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 wanted you to come on tour with them because of your propensity to kind of be band dad? Or no, no, no. I think um, so. They had a they had a tour manager, um, Chuck Andrews, uh, Chooch who was the best. Um, he's the best of the best at that. And, uh, you know, I, they, um, you know, they just wanted someone to help out with like, you know, guitar teching, setting up drums yeah, yeah, yeah. and that type of stuff. So, and, um, you know, I think they also knew that the breakup was, is a tough thing to deal with. Mm. And they were like, just come out and have fun and, yeah. and let's forget that, you know, um, I, I do think Chrissy took it rough, you know, um, in, in, in some ways too, just because I think, um, I think she took, you know, you take things to heart, you know, it's the, the, I think the one thing that really sucks about being in a band is how opinionated everyone is of your, of your art. And, um, mm. you know, everyone has something to say and even, but most of the time it's people who can't even play a guitar or can't write a song or can't sing a note, um, you know, who are, who are critical. And, um, I, I think she took it pretty, pretty rough as well. Um, so yeah, it, 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 yeah, it was a rough time. You know, it definitely was. Yeah. I, I find that this kind of interesting because I know that, um, I know that I, I remember just sort of like seeing your band uh, on the periphery of that whole like tooth and nail scene. Like I knew about your band because I was into bands like MXPX and because like tooth and nail and cornerstone, that whole like subculture were really fun for me. Um, yeah. and it was like a, it, that sort of felt like family. Like that's the last time that I remember there being this sort of, this sort of weird entity that had the ability to connect you with other kids who were just like you from yeah. like across the nation. Yeah. Um, but I know that, I know that they kind of like walked this weird line of having religiously charged acts, right. but also like being able to sort of maintain an artistic integrity or a punk rock sort of feel to everything that they were doing that wasn't really found in that particular scene at that time. Yeah. So yeah. where, where do you feel like you guys fit in? Like, did you grow up religious or what did that look like for you guys? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I grew up, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, you know, I think very, very early on when Chrissy and I first started, we kind of dabbled a little bit with like, you know, what does this mean to be a Christian in a band? And we just never felt comfortable with it. So mm. we just felt like, let's, we just want to be a band. Like we're just going to be a band. And to me, faith and doubt and all of that's very personal and private and, it's not something that any of us really felt comfortable talking about publicly, you know? Uh, so we just like, let's be a band. And I would say that, you know, before we signed, we were, we were friends and played shows with the Juliana theory. We were friends with Zayo. We were friends with obviously further seems forever a little bit after we signed, but you know, we looked at those bands as those are the bands that we want to model ourselves after. We want to kind of follow their lead. You know, we want to play regular shows. We want to play with, with regular bands um, you know, like when we first signed, uh, we did that run with Hangnail and the Undecided. You know, those those are really the only like tooth and nail or Christian bands that, you know, I would say we we played with. Um, and they were great guys. We didn't really I don't even think we played any really churches with them. You know, we, we really tried to avoid like the church show type stuff. I mean, it happened, you know, once in a while. You know, we, we worked with a manager, um, Jamie Arthur's out of Baltimore. He managed uh, early on. He managed Juliana Theory early on, Zayo further. But he also, he wasn't a Christian and he managed other bands like the Strider, River City High, you know, a lot of indie bands, yeah. um, you know, just on regular labels who weren't Christians. And so we ended up playing a lot of tours with them, you know, and uh, what it was at the time was a lot of those bands were kind of like us, right? They had one or two albums out on any label, you know, just trying to make a name for ourselves. And, you know, so like we, you know, we played band shows with like bands like Christensen, who was on Revelation or um, the Strider, like I said, Junction 18. I forgot what label they were on. Um, you know, we got in that piebald. We did a run with piebald. Uh, you know, the, uh, we did two different tours with further, which, which were great. Obviously those were all clubs, the Juliana theory tour. Um, we ended up playing shows with, I would say one of our collective favorite bands of all time, Sensefield. Yeah. Um, we 
got on a bunch of shows with them. I would say one of the, my favorite shows we ever played was um, the Paradise Rock Club in, in Boston opening for Sensefield. It was it was like a surreal show. Um, that was a band that we idolized and loved. And, you know, they liked us and wanted us to play shows with them. And it's it's like you're pinching yourself that you're playing with a band that you, you idolize, you know. Mm. So got on a few shows at Newfound Glory, which was awesome. And we, you know, obviously we played Cornerstone and, and Cornerstone was, was a blast. It was a great time to see like old friends and people that you, you meet around the country throughout the year. And But I, I also thought Cornerstone, I mean, from my perspective was it was really, it was super like low key, laid back. Like I didn't really ever feel like, you know, Christianity was thrown in anyone's face there or there was any like legalism or pressure in any way, yeah. uh, which, you know, which, which was not. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, we, we tried to follow the model of those bands, you know, just, just to be like good people, have your personal faith, but you know, you're in a rock band and, and you just want to be the best band that you possibly could be. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you've checked out any other episodes of this podcast. Um, uh-huh. One of the kind of recurring themes I feel like we keep we keep landing on is sort of like there are some artists that come on here that are that have like completely left the whole like Christian music industry like as a whole. It seems like there are a lot of bands that sort of come from the tooth and nail era that never really had the same experience within that subculture of Christianity that some some bands that were like a part of it on the other side of it. Like I, it seems like every band that we were kind of alongside of at the time that, that we got signed and we're doing all of our stuff with Flickr and Sony, that there was a very specific kind of brand of like Protestant evangelicalism that we were being exposed to all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it yeah. always seemed like we were always looking at bands that we had grown up listening to on tooth and nail being like, wow, this just seems so much easier to be doing it in that realm than Mm. to be constantly having to like prove how Christian we are in this realm. Um, And I feel like we always felt conflicted about that. We were, we were not like evangelical voices for the cross. Mm. (laughs) Like in our, in our band, it always made us feel weird that people wanted us to do that. Or we would have churches that would ask us to do like altar calls and stuff. And we're, and looking back on that now, it's like, I we're so far removed from all that stuff externally and internally. Mm -hmm. Now it's been like a really slow process of us kind of like looking back at that time in our life and our career and like realizing how kind of like weird it was (laughs) and how like it's only typical within this very, small like subsect of uh Mm. of christian music i guess um right how do you feel like being in element 101 changed you oh i for sure grew up you know i mean we would be again because we were so young we i mean we we saw that we saw the country right i mean we went out and the the first real tour we did was a seven-week tour yeah around the and you know we had no one to take care of us we took care of ourselves and i would say i matured a ton um grew up a lot learned a lot about life learned a lot about people uh learned about business like the business aspect of things yeah i learned lessons being in a band that that forever changed my life um now i'm an educator i would say you know i'm, I'm actually about a year away from from my doctorate and congratulations you know, so, uh, that's no you. small task my friend yeah so uh, you know <laughs> know uh how many years of school is that that's like you know it's gonna end up being like 10 years of college when i'm all said and done (laughs) i can honestly say that four years playing in a punk rock band was a far better education than than the 10 years of of regular university amen brother (laughs) so yeah so i would say yeah it it definitely changed me i I learned a lot about teamwork i learned a lot about setbacks um you know we we were talking the other day about how many times we lost our transmission we were stranded in the bayou of louisiana with a busted transmission we were stranded at um in pittsburgh luckily we had friends there with marty lunn and the zayo guys yeah you know, to take care of us, but you know, we, we lost an engine. I mean, so many different setbacks. So, you know, you learn how to, you know, how to bounce back from that, um, you know, playing in a band obviously is all about collaboration and teamwork and, you know, uh, working hard. I mean, I would say that, you know, those years in the band are probably some of the years I worked the hardest. And, and, you know, and after that, we all, all five of us worked in construction, 
Um, Nick, Nick's dad is a mechanic. He has like a, a you know, a, a metal shop and, uh, you know, Mizone is a, a, con, a construction supervisor. So, I mean, we, we're, we all have a construction background and I will say that those three or four years, you know, slugging around the country, loading, unloading, loading, unloading, you know, all of that driving through the night, that was some of the hardest work I've ever done. Yeah. You know, I don't know what they would say about it, but you know, that was, that was, that was tough, you know, it was tough work and, um, definitely wasn't glamorous in any way. Overall, you know, I learned a ton, man. I would say I grew up, you know, I would say I became a man be- being on the road. I think also because I was the oldest, I also felt responsibility for everyone else. And even more than that, because we had, you know, Chrissy in the band, the four of us were extremely protective of her. Um, you know, there, there was one show that, um, the song was over and I went to tune my guitar and I look over and I'm like, where is Sal? Sal jumped in the crowd and he, he was running after someone because they were saying something derogatory to Chrissy on stage. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I also say, you know, we were protective of her and, but I also think about it looking back, like how crazy were we, right? We, you know, there, there were so many times that Chrissy would say from stage, you know, we're in the middle of Arkansas. Hey, does anyone want to put up, you know, five, five of us tonight? You know, anyone have a floor we could sleep on? <laughs> no or, way. You know, Oh yeah. It feels like a different world. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we rarely could afford hotels. So, I mean, we would, we would maybe get maybe one hotel a week. Um, a lot of it was staying on strangers floors, but you know, after you, after you go through the country a few times, you become friends with people and you go through and they're like, every time you come through, you're staying with us. You know, we met some amazing people in, in, in cities that would put us up in some great places. And, um, you know, obviously there were some sketchy places as well, but, yeah. but, you know, we, you know, we made it through and, uh, you know, we did it together as a family. And, um, so yeah, I would say that I learned a ton from being in a band. It, it totally changed my, my, the trajectory of my life. I actually, um, I want to write a book. I, so I, this is the first time I'm putting this idea out there. I, I mean, I tell my wife all my crazy ideas, but I, I don't know if this will ever happen or not, but I would <laughs> love to write a book and, and the book would be um i want to have a chapter by each person who was in a band who is now in education they could write in the chapter about how being in a band um you know influenced their life as a teacher or an educator um i know you had um jeff from squad 50 on and he he talked a little bit about that uh-huh. you know someone i thought about reaching out to um greg the guitar player slick shoes he's um he's a teacher i think he's been teaching about 11 12 years yeah. in california um I have, a, I have a few other ideas of people to pursue. I don't know if this will ever happen. Some of the stretch but, guys, are they teachers? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think two of them, uh, I think two of the stretch guys are teachers, actually. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're still teaching, but I know they were back then. So you're right. They they would be perfect for a book like that. Um, love to do one day. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome, dude. I actually, it's, it's so funny. I'm always interested in people that end up getting into education after this kind of stuff. Cause I actually, whenever we got up or whenever our band broke up the first yeah. time, I, it was like a couple years later, I found myself like teaching college, <laughs> like teaching kids like music business and like touring and album production and pr- producing yeah. and like, we're just working the whole thing. And I found I found this really cool outlet for performance in that, that I, that I had missed like being in the band. Yeah. Without a doubt. Teaching is a performance. You're an entertainer. That That's how you engage kids in learning. Um, you know, even back in the day when I heard that Milo, um, the singer descendants was a college professor. I was like, that is the coolest thing, man. <laughs> you know? That's awesome, man. Well, yeah. I, best of luck with your, with your book idea. I hope that that, that that comes to fruition. Yeah, man one day i have i have to write my dissertation first so i have to uh, i have to make time for that what's your dissertation going to be on have you whittled it down yet i have so um in a really quick in a nutshell um short story here as a teacher um even before i got into teaching i became really passionate about the issue of, of human trafficking and modern slavery mm. and uh, I introduced the issue to my students at slavery today. They were blown away. They said, Mr. Papa, we have to do something about this. So we, we started this nonprofit organization. We did, we've done a ton of work in um, human trafficking prevention. Um, I do a ton of work in that now. And um, so my dissertation is going to be, I'm going to argue that the most effective way to teach history is to empower kids to make history. Mm. And that was really the idea that, uh, you know, that students are history makers, world changers. And, uh, 
giving them voice is is so important. And I'm, I'm just a huge advocate of student voice. I love um, what the March for Our Lives students are doing down in Florida. Um, I think education in this country would be far better if, if, if people, if adults would just get out of their own way and just listen to kids. It's, it's their education. Give them a voice. Let them speak. Listen to what they have to say. That's what I do all the time. I, um, I'm, in, I'm in administration now, and I make it a point. The decisions I'm making, I'm making because they're going to be informed by what kids say to me. Um, and, you know, if teachers don't like it, it's, that's fine because it's about the kids. And I would say that's another thing that influenced me from the music industry is just from the time I was, you know, going to punk and hardcore shows, all the bands that I, it was always, this is about the kids. It's for the kids. Right. And, and that's just been my mantra in teaching is this is about the kids. It's for them. It's their education. I have a responsibility to bet to be the best I can be for them. And so, yeah, so, so that's really along the lines. It's about empowering kids to, to make a difference. I absolutely love that. I, I feel like I don't know you <laughs> super well, but I get such wonderfully compassionate vibes from you through uh, <laughs> through our, our FaceTime chat. And yeah, I, I've loved hearing about the band. I've loved kind of like demystifying a little bit of that stuff. I, I, I know that we've gone our time for the show so far, but one of the things that we like to ask people kind of towards the end of every episode is where do you stand on the whole religious thing now? Like, what do you think happens when we die? Where, yeah. you know, like, what is your, do you have sort of like a guiding idea of how to live your best life or what, what living into meaning and purpose is for you? Yeah. I, I, I have a strong conviction that, that I'm, I'm a broken man and eight legalistic people. <laughs> um, I can't stand Pharisees. So, you know, I'm not one to ever say anything to anyone. Me personally, you know, I, you know, I, I still have faith. Um, my focus is, is squarely on the person of Jesus. And, um, you know, well, well after the band, I went through a really uh, about a five year period of just absolute loneliness. And in that, I feel like I really got to know, um, the person of Jesus in a way that I, I never knew him before. You know, there's a lot of authors out there that, um, write from a place of like a lonely heart and a broken heart. Yeah. And th that really resonated with me. Um, like authors like Brennan Manning, like the Ragamuffin Gospel, mm. is a book that changed my life. Richard Rohr, you know, just just men who write from a really broken spirit, and uh, that really resonated with me. And uh, yeah, it really helped me to get through, you know, a lot of uh, you know really super dark times. And I'm not a I'm not a fan of you know what the right wing Christian evangelical movement says or does. I'm a fan of you know who Jesus is and what he did and you know, the impact that he had because he loved people and he accepted people for who they were. And, and you know, my, my wife and I, you know, we go to church and I don't know, that, that's just kind of like where, you know, where I'm at with it. Um, obviously, I can't speak for anyone else in the band. I have, you know, for me, that's just where I'm at. But a, a lot of it, though, I have to say it is, you know, a long road that I've discovered genuinely and authentically through darkness. Um, and depravity. Yeah. It sounds like a very genuine and intimate expression of your journey that you've been on. Yeah. And I, I have, you know, I have friends who, who grew up and in, in, don't believe any longer. And I completely understand why yeah. <laughs> you know? when, um, you know, when, when Christians treat people the way they do, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a huge, it's hurtful and it's a turn off and, and, it, and it's a shame. I totally get it. I'm a broken man, you know, so who, who am I to ever say anything to anybody or about anyone? That's just, you know, where, where I'm from with it. Well, that's, yeah, I think those are fantastic sentiments. Uh, and Danny, I really appreciate the time that we've got to spend together. I hope that none of this, uh, none of this stops you from making the most badass record of your career. Uh, well, we'll see. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so did, did, have we ever met, were, were you ever at any of the South Carolina shows or? No, I, I literally just remember, I think that was like the first place that I heard about your band was, okay. was on a flyer because I'd seen it yeah. with a bunch of other tooth and nail stuff. And then I think I, within our friend group, there were like five or six of us, I think that had your, a few of your records or, you know, we were always being exposed to all that stuff. Like, I, 
all at once. Um, right, right. Yeah. So, but I don't think I ever got to see. I know I I know I never got to see your band live. There were so many so many bands that we wanted that kind of sold us on this romanticized version of like what the scene was that uh, we wanted to be a part of. And by the time yeah. that we came around, it was like nineteen. We got offered our first record deal. And like yeah. all of these bands that we actually cared about were like had reached a breaking point and were either quitting or breaking up or just had disbanded. It was like sure. all the all the five iron dudes, like we were it was like our dream to be able to tour with five iron and bands like that that were just like big and loud and goofy and fun and like kind of embodied this like joy and the spirit yeah. of like what all of that was. Um mm-hmm. And it was like MXPX went on to like be on a major label and then go on their weird like hiatus thing. So like we we did get to do a few shows with them at some festivals. I actually ended up in a band with some of the Five Iron folks like oh. after the fact. But yeah, it just seemed like all of the just something changed. Like the 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 scene changed. It didn't feel like it was something that was tying everyone together anymore. It seemed really polarizing. Almost every band turned into like a hardcore band. Um, and yeah. yeah, and it just kind of like washed itself out. I don't mm-hmm. know, or like homogenized yeah. to the point of not, not being interesting anymore. Right. But yeah, and and maybe it's just the way that I'm remembering it. But it seemed like the best time to be a part of all of that was like late '90s, <laughs> early 2000s. I was like, yeah. I was I was super into bands like Joy Electric and MXPX and right. you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Danny. And um, we will, is there, can I link people to something in the show notes? Um, I think maybe for now we're we're, again. So I I feel like a caveman in the sense of like, you know, we existed before everything, you know, that's out now. So we're trying to keep up. So we're going to start like a Facebook page. Um, We have to figure out how to get control of that Spotify page. Okay. I don't know who controls it, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, maybe just our Instagram for now. Um, that's probably where we're going to do a lot of our, you know, we'll put new stuff out through there. Obviously Spotify, you know, we're going to set up a band camp page, but for now, um, probably just our Instagram and uh, Spotify. I guess it's Spotify Awesome. Now. Well, I'm going to throw up a link to your disco on Spotify for everybody in the show cool. notes. Great. So well, this, is, this has been great. Thank you so much for reaching out. And, uh, I really appreciate, you know, you taking me down memory lane here. Cause some of this stuff is still foggy, right? I mean, it's so long ago. <laughs> I, I uh, I'm it. an old man. So, uh, trying to remember it is, is, is a little tough, but thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. 11 life is a production of rock candy recording.